I'm convinced just fasting and praying won't get you problem done. It's going to have to be some faith. He said, fasting, praying, and receiving. God wants to give what he has to us liberally and freely. The mustard seed stands for purity of faith. Purity of faith. So we're going to share with you this morning, when you fast and pray, I want you to expect to receive something. Not a year, two years from now, it may be that, but expect you to receive it like Diane had that problem out there with that big bus. Now, what was 30-something kids? But she talked to God about it, how she was going to get that bus out of that situation, and God answered that prayer when she got up in the morning and went to see what was going to happen, it was already done. I want us to start believing when you fast and pray, you're going to get something. Amen? Can I have an amen? God wants you to receive. It's not so much I found out the old man we're having problems with. It's with the new man obeying God. We are a new creature in Christ. The old man is gone. What he wants to do is to train the new man to hear his word and then do his word. And that Sunday school class this morning, it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. But the Bible said in the last day there will be a famine in the land for hearing the word. He didn't say the word wasn't going to be preached. He said the word is being preached, but there's a famine of hearing the word and doing the word. So when you hear the word, you got to do what? You got to do the word. And when you do the word, what you've been fasting and praying for, you will receive. We're going to receive some results. And Nehemiah fasted and prayed by faith that he would receive what he asked for. And as soon as he got through talking to the king, the king gave him exactly right then and there what he had asked for. Because he'd talked to the king up there first. He'd fasted and talked to the king first. So Nehemiah fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, it says in chapter 1, verse 4, and also in chapter 2, verse 4, he told the king that I have been fasting and praying to the God in heaven. How many believe that God is able to do more than what you can even imagine? Elisha was drinking water from the creek, and it dried up. The raven kept quit coming, Sister Pat. There he was. He had been a man who fasted and prayed for 40 days, and there he was. But then the Lord told him, said, I have commanded a widow to feed you. Can you imagine that? Widows have a hard time even in this life. But in another life, in the world back then, they had a harder time. It said, but I have commanded a widow to feed you. You get up and go to that country where she is. And when he gets there, and no doubt, when he looked into that house and seen what was going on, he probably thought, my Lord, what have you sent me to? She says, oh, it said, she wasn't an Israelite. And she said, he's your God. He's not my God. He's not my God. But I want you to know God had commanded her before we ever got there, there was going to be a man a coming, and I want you to feed him and preserve him. She says, all I've got is enough, a little meal for one little cake, and me and my son is going to eat that, and then we're going to die. God can supply your need out of nothing, abundance out of nothing. When he commanded that with us, to do what he said to do, she immediately went and cooked that loaf. I don't know whether y'all see this or not. But what she was going to eat and die, now she's going to give it away, she thought, and die. But to her amazing, it began to multiply. How I many you know that bread in Jesus' hand began to multiply when he broke it? He fed 5,000 men in a wilderness where there was nothing out of the supernatural abundance of God. 
When we fast and pray, we're going to receive. Can you say amen? God wants us to receive what he's got when it looks impossible. It's not impossible with God, what he can do for us. I'm looking for some great things to happen. But one of the problems we have is this. 2 Corinthians bring under captivity ever thought to the obedience of Christ. I don't know about you, but ever since I've been in a church, in which that's a good thing, you to bring ever what? Evil thought what? In captivity. That's good teaching. But there's another side of that coin. When God gives you a word from heaven and from his lips, you need to bring that into captivity under the obedience of Christ and get ready and watch what Christ will do when we bring what he gives us. How many believe that every good and perfect gift comes from above? But you've got to get a hold of that thing and bring it under the obedience of Christ, and then you will see the miraculous results coming from that. You look around today, you think, where's everybody at? Is that right? But I want you to start thinking it's full. I want you to start thinking that God's supplying all of your needs according to his riches and glory. There's a wonderful blessing right here in this house today. I feel the presence of the Lord when I come up here this morning. I won't tell you what time I got here. I didn't know Peggy was up, but I was getting to walk out of the door. She said, you're not going up there this early, are you? I said, yes, I'm going this early. I mean, you know, when God moves on you to do something, you're going to have to do it if you're going to get the fruit of, of what he says. Ken done a good job in his Sunday school class, and one of our major problems in life is fear. Like he pointed out, what came on Job is what he feared. When you fear something, the devil's going to take that and bring it to pass in your life. Not God, but the devil is. Glory to God. You know, the devil appeared before the Lord, and the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? You all know the story real well, but I want you to notice this. He said, I'm going to turn him into your hand, and you can do whatever you want to do with him. Just do whatever you want to do with him. But one thing you're not to do, you're not to take his life. How I many you know the devil can't take your life in the worst of conditions? Because he has a commandment from God, he can't do it. And when it looks so bad and nothing's so good, don't take his life. Faith is so vital and important. Peter said something to Jesus one time, and Jesus said, Satan, get thee behind me. You know it's not the things of God. He wasn't directing his words to Peter. He was directing his words to the spirit that Peter was saying, get thee behind me. Listen, as long as the devil can't take your life, you're going to be able to get the victory that God has promised you. As long as he can't steal your life and your faith that God is praying. How many believe that God is praying for you right now not to get you out of trouble, not to get you to bypass trouble. He's praying for you that your faith will not waver in the midst of your storm and in it, your trouble because that's where your victory comes from is your faith in God. You ought to stand to your feet. I'm serious about this. We ought to stand to our feet more often and thank God for problems. Norman Vincent Peale, still in the pulpit when he was in his 90s, he said, if you don't have a problem, get out on your knees and cry before God and beg him to give you a problem. Listen, problems and trials is the only thing that God sends us to perfect our, I mean, to perfect our faith. Y'all didn't say Amen. 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 Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And no man is above Jesus. You're going to have to do some suffering. That's where he perfects your faith. The trying of your faith. I've learned some things this week. I've spent some time weeping and crying before God. And I asked the class Wednesday night to lay their hands on me and pray for me. For my failures or my sins and not believing God enough for what he said. I mean, you know, if God says it, he'll bring it to pass. He will bring it to pass. I'm going to just...
fast forward here a minute. I'm not going to go too far and going to go over into Jericho because our Sunday school lesson is next week on it. Some of it was this week, and I didn't know it because I've had this message about two weeks. God never said, I'm going to give you the land. That's not scripture. That's not in your Bible. He didn't say that. He says, I have given it to you. God says the promises that I have promised, I've already given them to you. You already got what God said you has. It's already yours. It already belongs to you. The wonderful things of God. We're blessed going in and what? God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt for the purpose of bringing them into Canaan and to their promise. That was his purpose, to bring them out. He brought you out of darkness to bring you into his light and his wonderful blessings of God. If I could sing, I'd sing to you this morning, I am blessed. I'm blessed in my trials. I'm blessed in my sorrow. I'm blessed in my disappointments because I have learned wherever I'm met, God is there also. So we're blessed in everything we do. Some writer says, there's no way the Christian can lose anything. You cannot lose. Job did not lose. He had the right attitude in his storm and his afflictions. He said, though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. That's one of the reasons he got a double portion. Are you ready for a double portion in your life? Oh, Victor, what you've got now, then learn to say, I am going to trust God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. I don't care if I don't see anything in the future. I am going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. Amen. Praise God. Fast and pray and what? And receive. I'm going to receive. I mean, you know, the new man has to be trained. This new man in here, when you're born again, he, he's a new man. He's a child. He's got to learn how to walk by faith and do the things of God because he's new. The Holy Spirit is the one that's sent to teach us. He's with you always. Hebrews 11, 24 said, By faith Moses, when he was come to age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When we become a new creature in Christ, we need to refuse our old life. We need to say, I will not believe what Satan says to me. I'm going to believe what God says to me. I believe there's great things for the church of God right now. The wonderful blessings overflowing us now and abundance flowing over for us. The magnificent power of God. God has no limits. Disciples need to pay more attention to what God is saying. Everything going up. I don't know what the price of eggs now is someplace what I think here in town is what. Insurance is going up. Everything going up, right? The disciples said, I can't pay my taxes. And Jesus said, I tell you what to do, boys. Go down and go fishing. Brother Michael, he, I don't think he'd got there when I got there yesterday. I was waiting on him. And this guy come in. He said, don't look at me so. I said, said, I just got up. Didn't want to get up. Said, I was having one of the best dreams you could ever have. I said, what was you doing? He said, I was dreaming. I was fishing. I said, was you catching anything? He said, no, I wasn't catching anything, but it was a beautiful dream. I was dreaming. I was fishing. And Jesus tells them what to do. What did he tell them to do? Huh? What did you say, Brother Clayton? Go fishing. Go fishing. What do they got to do now? A doer of the word. Got to do the word. So they go fishing. And he told them something else. Do what? Say it out loud. 
that first fish you catch, you pull him up and look in his mouth. Isn't that a strange place to look to get money to pay your taxes, to look in the fish's mouth? God wants you blessed in whatever you are in. He can bless you when the nature says no, your feeling says no, and the devil says no. But if we are a doer of the word, it's going to come to pass. We're going to receive what God said. I don't know what their taxes was. Church don't pay no taxes, but you'd be surprised and shocked by what it costs the insurance to keep it going. Because things are what? Going up. Going up. So if things are going up, God is going to have to increase the blessings on your life. You're going to fast, and you're going to pray, and you're going to do what? You're going to receive. And I know some way down the road, but I feel in my spirit God wants you to see and feel it happening now in your life. He said, I have given it to you already. Now, Diane didn't see that God had worked out that bus situation, but there early that morning when she got up and walked down there, but she was speaking the word. She was shocked when she got down there. What she seen, all them cars had that bus parked in, was gone. How I many you know that your problems can be gone or fixed while you're sleeping and getting a good night's rest if you will speak the word of God and believe you're going to receive what God says? I have what God says I have. I'm receiving what God says I'm receiving. God supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. God works supernatural things. Elisha asked for a double portion. Elijah says, you're asking for a hard thing. That, that's going to be hard. That's going to be difficult. How many know there's nothing too hard or difficult for God? But the condition was for Elisha to keep his eyes where? How many know you're going to have to keep your eyes on Jesus and not on your problems? You can't be thinking about your problems and get the blessings of God. You need to look at the author of your faith and the finisher of your faith. Now, what that means, God has to grow our faith. We ought to have more faith today than we did when we got into church. Ought to be more excitement today for us than when we first got into church because we have seen more of the wonderful blessings of God. So what did Elisha have to do? What do you have to do? No, he, he, he's got to keep his eyes on the promise. The promise was Elijah coming through him to Elisha. He had a lot of distractions. They tell us today we can only stay focused seven minutes. We've lost the ability to stay focused because of the things of this world distracts us so much. But Elisha was determined he was not going to be distracted. When they come and told him certain things, he said, hush your mouth. I'm going to get the promise. How many believe that this morning you can have what God says you can have and what you speak you can have it as long as you're keeping your eyes on the promise and off your feelings and off of this world? God is greater than anything that's happening in our lives. Something good is in the air. I believe that. How many believe that this morning? Let me share something with you here. That um, The mighty army had surrounded Ahab. Everything looked hopeless. Does anybody in here beside me sometimes see things looks hopeless and you don't know what's going to come up? Everything looked hopeless. 
Didn't look like nothing was going to work out. This great army was around him. And the Lord gave him a word. And this was the word he gave him. You shall be delivered. And Ahab says, by whom? He said, by 232 young men, they will destroy this army for you. I want you to catch this word, young men. He's not talking about age. I'll come to that again here in a minute. You must stay young in spirit, young in faith. Jesus says, I'm going to do a new thing. That word means to say fresh and alive. The Bible talks about being green. That means fresh and alive. Faith and spirit has got to stay fresh and alive. Can you say amen? It cannot grow old and dry. Brother Melvin, I don't care how old you are. I know how old you are. Can I be a little bit bold this morning? Scholars say it's rare to ever see fresh and alive faith in an old person because we go by our feelings. We go by our complexion. We go by the loss of strength. And when it's not by the physical strength, Zachariah said it's not by your intelligence. It's not by your education. It's not your position in life, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen? It's the Spirit of God. It doesn't make how old you are. It doesn't make how weak you are. It's the Spirit of the Lord. Let the weak say, I am strong. I am strong in the might of the Lord. I've had people through the years say, I'm not going to say what I don't feel. That's because they've been mistrained. They've been mistaught. You're going to have to say what you don't feel and say what you feel that God is my Redeemer. God is my Savior. God is my supplier. What did Paul say? Who was your supplier? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, if I say I'm healed, I'm not healed. I'm a lion. No, you speak in faith. You're speaking what God tells you to say. You're acting in faith. And you shall receive what you're saying. Zechariah 9 and 12. Even today, God says, I declare. Somebody ought to say even today. Even today. God said, even today, Brother Ted. He said, even today, I'm going to declare to you today, I am going to give you a double portion today. Even today, I declare, I'm going to give you a double portion. How many need a little double portion? A double portion of the Spirit. A double portion of joy. A double portion of peace. What God has declared, he will bring to pass. You got to be young at heart. I don't know this guy, but I read some of his articles. He said, I was in my 50s, and I could tell I was losing my strength. And so the wrinkles started coming in on my face. And he said, I, I, I knew I was getting old, but I intended I wasn't going to get old. said, so I started hanging around young people. And the first thing you know, all them wrinkles gone and all my strength come back. And when he's in his 70s, he got a sickness. They said he couldn't live. He said, I'm going to live. Listen, God expects us to say what the Word of God says about us and not what we feel and what the devil tells you. Say what God says and how he was miraculously healed. I love this scripture right here. Second Chronicles 7 and 1. When Solomon finished praying, I think the temple was what? About seven years in building or more? Anybody know? I forgot to look that up. 
But it was many, many years in building. And when he got the temple built, he stood outside the door and he prayed to God. And the Bible said when he finished this prayer, the fire from heaven fell. And fill the temple with the glory of God. How many know you not that your body is a temple of the glory of God? And when you finish praying, there ought to be some fire coming down in here. There ought to be some glory filling that temple like never been felt and experienced before. Not a one-time experience. I believe that the temple of God is to have the Spirit of God 24 hours a day in your life and alive, burning, and flowing through it. Praise God. Fast, pray, and what? And receive. Fast, pray, and receive. The good things of God. God says that it's yours. It belongs to you. Good things is happening today. Proverbs says this. Proverbs 21 and 31, the horse is prepared for battle. But deliverance belongs to the Lord. You must prepare for what you want to get from God. There's some preparation that has to be done sometime before you get things from God. But you do not depend on your preparation. You depend on God to do it as you have prepared. You look for God to rain his glory down. That's what Solomon did. He looked for God to fill the temple. Look for God to supply all of your needs and what you have a need of from God. And the wonderful blessings of God. We're like Job. As long as the devil can't steal our faith, we're going to come back victorious. It is a good thing to serve God and walk with God. Numbers 32 and 11. God tells Joshua this. Surely none of the men that came up with you out of Egypt and from 20 years and old and upward shall not see the land of Canaan promised by Abraham because, he said, they did not follow me wholly. That means they was not holy heart fallen from God. They was worried about the onions and links. You can get so worried about the problems of this world that you don't follow God wholly by your heart. The world has compassed us so about sometime. And he said they can't go. I'm going to tell you how I'm here in a few seconds. Uh, he corrected that. He said this generation is now those that are older than 58 or 60 years of age. There's only be an exception to the rule that gets to go. Anybody know who they were? Those are 58 and 60. No one's going to get to go. Who is going to get to go? Moses. He's 120. Joshua, he's going to get to go. How old is he? He's 85. Who is going to get to go? Caleb, because he's 85. So it had nothing to do with the age. It has to do with they wouldn't follow in God wholeheartedly. Their heart was not fixed on God. Moses' wife didn't get to go because her heart wasn't fixed on God. 
holy, totally sold out. Paul was sold out. He said, I'm a fool for Christ. He said, the zeal of the house of the Lord has eaten me up. When he stood before the king, the king said, Paul, you go mad because his zeal and his zealousness for God. Aaron, the high priest, Moses' brother, didn't get to go. Maron, his sister, didn't get to go. You said, Brother Billy, you're painting a morbid picture. I'm painting you a picture if you wholeheartedly follow after the promises of God, you're going to receive what God said that he has given you. The blessing is already there for you to pick up and receive of the blessings of God. Oh, it's there, church. It's already there. But there's every promise in the Bible has some time conditions. Life has conditions that we have to meet, receive the wonderful blessings of God. Amen. Dr. Cho passed away about a year or so ago. He built a church up in the millions. And uh, they was building this new facility, and they run out of money. And the architect told them, he said, you're going to have to do something soon. said, the beams are rusting. We're going to have to take them down and start all over. He went out inside the at night and wept and cried and asked God to let the thing fall on him and kill him because they don't know what to do. But God showed him what to do. I want you to know that God will show you in your darkest hour what you need to do to rebuild. Nehemiah in the darkest hour when he rode his mule, right, Brother John? He rode his mule by himself. Is that right? I didn't go to all that. By himself. And when he got to the rubbish of Jerusalem, it was so bad, destructive. Listen. Oh, glory to God. We went up the Rhine River in the Navy. I guess we must have been in the 50s. We anchored out and killed Germany and caught a taxi and went over to Hamburg, Germany. What did we see? This was in the 50s. What did we see, brother? Destruction. That city was still in ruin, barricaded off in so many places that we was not allowed to go in because it's such a ruin. Joshua got off of his mule and climbed on his hands and knees because he had a vision. He had a word from God from fasting and praying that he was going to rebuild that city. He rebuilt it. Hallelujah. We're going to rebuild your life, my life, and things of God, but we will not do it without opposition. But thank God, let the devil bring on his opposition. We have a message from God that we're going to rebuild our lives and rebuild the church. Well, I sure hope so. You probably won't be here to see it then. You've got to follow God wholeheartedly. The wonderful blessings of God. I don't follow the war too much in Ukraine and Russia, but I believe this. I believe God has got a hand on Ukraine. If he hadn't, Russia would have done destroyed that country. God is for us and not against us. In Deuteronomy 11, 32 and 11, they did not follow him wholeheartedly. Let's have a heart for God, a whole heart for God, for the things of God. Where a man's treasure is, that's where his what? Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. That's where you're going to spend most of your conversation. You're talking about your treasure. We need a treasure, the greatest treasure in the world is the Word of God, is the power of God. I'm not going to go into this too much because I think I didn't know it until I read the Sunday school lesson for this week. And then I cheated and went forward and read the one for next week. 
So I thought, well, I won't say all I was going to say, but I am going to say this. He told them to go around that city, march around it. First day, seven times. Last day, seven times. That city covered 12 miles square and keep their what? Keep their what? Mouth shut. It's not how loud you pray. Hannah prayed and her lips moved, but nothing came out. Her heart, Sister Linda, was praying. Her heart was praying. And she got what she asked for. She fasted and prayed and received. Oh, go to God. God's saying, if you'll keep circling the promise, the walls look impregnated. Men's hearts on the inside had failed them. 600,000 people marching around. I feel in my spirit, God saying, if you'll keep marching around the promise and don't go weary in well-doing, sooner than you think, he's going to say, shout and blow the trumpet, which is a prophetic word of God. Shout loud, and then you'll promise is going to be fulfilled. Praying, fasting, and receiving. You're going to see something miraculous from God. You're going to see it. Hallelujah. As far as I'm going to go on that, there's some more on that. But I am going to share this story with you here that I cut out, or someone sent it to me, even when I worked. People would cut out things from magazine and send to me, and some of them I still got in my folder at home. This lady's name is Clara McBrad Hale. She's a black woman. She was born in 1905. Hale had provided a haven for over 600 babies born addicted to drugs. My first child was named Nathan. Oh, I was really American, and I wanted them to all know. Lorraine, my daughter, was five when he died. Other people's children brought to me These children didn't want to go home as they spent in my home. And the parents got where they just give me a dollar to keep them. To keep them. I kept them all the time. I'm going to say something else before I go a bit further. I don't know that Sister Artwell may be went part of the depression. Not the depression, but uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's the Great Depression in the 30s. So that puts this lady in there. And also puts her in there in the area of the Great Depression and the area of World War II. She was in that. I want you to notice what she said. I raised 40 of these children. Every one of them went to college and graduated. Can you imagine during the, the Great Depression and World War II? You, if, if you don't know about it, you ought to read about it. What devastating times that was. Suit lines. 
It was a horrible situation. Let me read that again. I raised 40 of these. Ever one of them went to college, graduated, and they all 40 have lovely jobs because of one widow in the Great Depression in World War II. In 1969, that would make her, what, about 64? I decided I wouldn't take care of no more children. Then my daughter sent to me a girl with an addicted baby. Now, she was going to quit. A few years ago, I was at a funeral. I don't remember where I preached it or not. And I was walking out by myself, and this couple caught up with me and said, I heard you want to retire. And I said, yes. And they said, you know, there's nowhere in the Scriptures that a minister is supposed to retire. Death is the only thing that's supposed to take you. And they kept walking. I don't know whether that was from God or not. <laughs> And I just don't know. Amen. <laughs> but she decided to retire, I guess, at 64. I wasn't going to take no more children. How I many know that no Christian, since I've been in the church, I've heard people and I've heard some ministers' wives that I've done my part. It's time for somebody else to do it. I'm quitting. We're obligated to God and his covenant as long as we live. We're obligated. Can you imagine putting 40 kids through college today? During the Depression. During World War II. You couldn't buy coffee during World War II. I don't know what Peggy would have done. She's afraid she's going to run out of coffee. She'll go down. She's got a big box full at the house and get another box full. I said, we got this. I know we got that, but I'm going to make sure you didn't buy sugar. I won't go into all of that. But here's a woman just putting 40 kids through college, decided to quit. Her daughter brought her this girl with an addicted child. God kept sending them addicted children to me. Now, she raised 600 addicted children on drugs. Single woman during the Depression, during World War II, God, she didn't say the people kept sending them. She said God kept sending them to me. Could it be that God knew that she was going to take care of them? You ought to read, if you can, about George Mueller and what he did. Not one time in his life. Did he ever tell God he needed money? I'm telling anybody he needed money. He would ask God, and God always supplied. How many know God is your supplier? When you make him your number one in life, he will supply. Evidently, Clara had made God number one in her life, and he kept opening a way for me to make it. He kept sending these addicted children. As they came, God kept opening a way for me to take care of them. Isn't it wonderful that God would keep on doing that? Then she goes on to say, you can set out in the world and say, well, 
white people are keeping me back. I can't do this. She said, that is not so. You know what? who keeps us back? Anybody want to help me on that? Who keeps us back from receiving the things of God? It's not the devil. Our first pastors used to say, the devil can't win. You just sit there and let him win. I learned that when I first got in the church. He, oh, glory to God. Y'all remember Sister Madeline's testimony when C.O. died? She had three children, and her brother would live with her. And uh, I won't go into details about him, but said she fell on the floor and cried and wept. Y'all remember her telling that? Just cried and wept. God, I'm on the mercy of this world. And God spoke to her and said, Madeline, you're not on the mercy of this world. You're on my mercy, and I'm going to take care of you. Oh, they just built her a new home right over here not too long ago. I want you to know that the world has no control over your life. You're at the mercy with God. They kept coming, and God kept coming. And she said, the white people are keeping me back. I can't do this. She said, that's not so. Are you all ready for page two? Anybody want to hear page two? Okay, let's go with page two. You have, you can have anything you want if you make up your mind. Here she is. Raised 600 addicted children. Put 40 through college during the Depression and World War II. Then she goes on to say, You don't have to crack somebody on the head. You don't have to steal or anything. You don't have to be smart like the men of, of high stealing all the money. We're good people, and we try, and God supplies. Can you say amen? Oh, I'm telling you, church, God is so good to us. In the book of Judges, the prophet tells Deborah, Awake, awake. Deborah, awake, awake. I guess it's been two weeks ago, and I asked Sister Jean Meadows, could I tell this? She said, yes. When I walked off the stage right there, she was standing there with Peggy. When I touched her, I would have fell down. I mean, I would have, I just touched her, I would have fell down. I, if I hadn't got a hold of her and Peggy, I would have fell down on the presence of God. And she's the one that said this. The word had give her that to come down and say that. The word awake means be watchful and be on alert. Be watchful and to be on alert. He told Deborah, I have this delivered the Syrian army in your hands. But the king escaped this army of Barak. He runs to the tent of a woman named Jael and runs inside and asks for refuge. Asked her to stand at the tent if anybody come by. Say, I'm not in here. She says, okay. She did more for him. Now, God had promised Deborah, I have given the enemy into your hand. But he escapes. He escapes. Did y'all hear the new speaker of the house speak the other day? What they planning on doing? 
He said, some of our decisions to rule this country won't come out of the Congress or the Senate. It will come from somebody from outside. That's reaching out. That's reaching beyond. She did more. J.L. did more than what he asked for. She laid him down on a little pad. She gave him some milk. Sister Linda, she might have had one of your baked rolls. Hmm? He's weary and he's tired. Listen, deliverance was going to come, but not from Deborah and not from Barak. Oh, God, how many hear what the Word of God says? Deliverance may not be from the high up. It may not be from the strong official. It may not be from the general of the war. But God has a woman somewhere going to bring deliverance. That could be you. That could be you. She gave him that milk. Didn't say bread, but I just put that in there, okay? There he is. He gets his tummy full. Peggy can't sleep unless her tummy's full. She hungry. She going to have to get up and get something and put in that tummy. Sometimes she asked me before we go to bed, said, you want anything to eat? She said, I said, no. She said, I got to eat something. I can't sleep. But this milk, you know, and that roll, oh, he ate that and laid his head down and it doesn't say this, but I believe probably she sang to him. He is her enemy. He is the one that came to destroy her and her family. This very intelligent woman, when he fell fast asleep, got a stake pin that they stake the tent down with and got a mall that they drive them stakes in the ground to hold that tent. And she stuck it in his temple right there. Oh, goodness. That got to be courageous. Is that not right? God gives you the power to destroy your enemy. This wants to destroy you. You don't destroy him physically. She hit that thing with that pen, that, with that mallet, and drove it through his head, down into his temple, and out into the ground, and nailed him to the ground. I'm telling you, that was a bloody mess, that blood splitting out of his head. She went to the gate or to the tent door. When Barak came by, they was looking for him. He said, he's in here, <laughs> but he ain't going to give you no trouble. He looked in there and there he was, laid out <laughs> with his head stuck to the ground because God said, I have given him to you. You could be the one that could bring the deliverance because you're a child of God. Someone told me the other day, scientists say they're right on the verge of putting an implant in your brain. If you have a spinal cord injury, which they cannot repair today, and you're paralyzed from your waist down, they, they're just that close to getting ready to put that in these people. That thing they put in that brain will send a message to your body. It will bypass that broken spot in your spine and put life in that spinal cord that's broken down in there. And you'll get up and walk and you'll run. I want you to know we got something to look forward to in the kingdom of God, the blessings of God. We're going to fast. We're going to pray. And what else? I'll give you an example. They fasted and prayed and they received. So don't think you're old and you're going to quit. You're going to turn it over to the young. You're going to have to stay young at heart. You may get old. But you don't have to quit. There's a retirement home in Mount Pleasant for Clydesdale horses. This got so old they can't function in their position no more. I've been tended to go over and see them, but I hadn't. But this person 
has them known around the world. They can bring them there, and they live out there retirement right there, just eating and drinking and being curd every day. And we're going to fast, and we're going to pray, and we're going to do what? We're going to receive. Who knows who the God will choose to deliver maybe your family and somebody else's family. Reading this, there's some more stories on this other side. Sometimes we don't realize the struggle that people go through to reach the pinnacle that they're after. The struggle and the pain and what they have to fight. And the message is, don't never give up. Fast, pray, and you shall what? You're going to receive. Today, you're going to receive. Keep circling, keep circling. And then when God tells you to shout, shout aloud because your promise has come alive to your life. God bless you for being here today. God bless you. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you.